Hello, uh, everyone. Uh, thank you all for uh, joining in for today's uh, Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, I'm Vijihi Batuman, the Interim Chair of Deming Department of Medicine. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, our friend, uh, our own uh, Paul K. Welton, who's a uh, professor of medicine and the Shochuan Chair in Global Public Health Tulane. Dr. Welton is a medical graduate of the University of College Cork in Ireland. He earned a master's degree in clinical epidemiology from the University of London and a doctoral research degree from National University of Ireland. He spent 26 years at Johns Hopkins where he founded the Welch Center for Prevention, Epidemiology and Clinical Research. Subsequently, he served as Tulane University Dean, School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, Dean School of Medicine and Senior Vice President for Health Sciences. Later, he was the president and CEO of the Loyola University Health System and Medical Center before returning to Tulane as the Shochuan Health System Endowed Chair in Global Public Health. Dr. Welton's research interests focus on cardiovascular and renal disease epidemiology, prevention, clinical trials, health policy, and global health. He has led many of the landmark NIH-funded blood pressure intervention trials, including the trials of hypertension prevention, TOHP, phases one and two, and trial of non-pharmacologic intervention in the elderly, the TONE study, the antihypertensive lipid lowering to prevent uh, heart attack trial, the OLHAT trial, and the systolic blood pressure intervention trial, the SPRINT trial. Dr. Welton chaired the 2017 ACC AHA guideline uh, writing committee for prevention, detection, evaluation, and management of high blood pressure, as well as many working groups and committees for institutes at the NIH, the American Heart Association, the Institute of Medicine, the Irish government, and the Shochuan Health System in Taiwan. Amongst many awards and honors, he has received the uh, American Heart Association Population Research Prize. He has published uh, nearly 500 reviewed manuscripts and 70 books, book chapters, supplements, uh, monographs. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Welton to you. He will present to us high blood pressure in the context of COVID-19. Paul, please take away. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. And uh, it's a wonderful pleasure to be with you at any time, but especially today for Grand Round. So. <clears throat> I, I don't have any conflicts of interest and, and the disclosures are really ones that you've covered already. So I want to talk today a little bit about high blood pressure in the context of COVID-19, something that's been important for many of us. So I, I will try to cover sort of the basic issues, uh, health consequences of high blood pressure and our contemporary management of uh, hypertension. And then I want to transition to coronavirus and its relationship to the renin angiotensin system and its implications and a lot of research that has gone on around that. And last, I want to talk about the implications of uh, a crisis like the COVID-19 pandemic. But we've had many crises before. We had Katrina here and there are crises all over the world. What that is what the implications are short-term and long-term for the burden of cardiovascular disease. So those are the three topic areas. And let's start by uh, just talking briefly about blood pressure and risk. And we know that there's a tremendous relationship between blood pressure and all cardiovascular outcomes in cohort studies. And I'm showing uh, two panels here from cohort studies on the left. We also see that in electronic uh, linkage studies. I'm showing that on the right-hand panel. I'll just focus on the cohorts. And in individual cohorts and pooling, and this one shows pooling of 61 cohorts, about a million people. Interestingly, blood pressure, even measured in a clinic a couple of times, you know, not a very good <laughs> estimate of, of what the body is seeing in terms of blood pressure, but even doing that, you see a striking relationship with all outcomes. I show here stroke, ischemic heart disease, but you could put up heart failure, you could put up end-stage renal disease, you see the same pattern. And it's there for as 
continuously for all the blood pressures that are measured, in this case from about 115 systolic up to over 180. It's more striking, the steeper relationship, if you will, at younger age, because there are very few other risk factors. When you get to older age, you have a lot of other risk factors. It's a little less steep, but it's continuous. And the thing that's striking here is there's no threshold for risk. The body recognizes blood pressure as a, as a risk factor, doesn't even know the term hypertension. So that's really striking. And if we look at the impact of blood pressure from 115 and above and try to compare that to the impact of other risk factors, Global Burden of Disease Study Group has done this uh, some years, and this is a portrayal of a recent publication that looked at baby behavioral, environmental, and occupational uh, and metabolic risks and risk factors. And what you always find is that blood pressure really dominates the picture in terms of death and in terms of disability adjusted life years. In other words, death and serious um, serious adverse effects, alive but not doing well. And it's really the only risk factor that is more potent than smoking. Uh, it's more potent than everything. Uh, so it, it, it is the key risk factor. And when we go with World Health Organization or PAHO into middle and low income countries, we go straight for blood pressure because it's the most important risk factor and it's the one we can impact uh, the quickest. Now, there's a very interesting publication from my son, Seamus. Uh, and many of you will know Seamus. Uh, my son, Seamus, and my daughter, Megan, are proud graduates of the School of Medicine uh, and School of Public Health at uh, Tulane. And Seamus is on the faculty in cardiology at Hopkins. He reported a, what I think is a very interesting study recently. It is done in a cohort called MESA, the uh, um, multi-ethnic um, cohort. And he looked at blood pressure uh, at a lower range from 90 up to 129. And he looked at that in the context of MESA participants who had very low cardiovascular risk. They did not have an existing uh, cardiovascular event. They had no history of that. They didn't have lipid abnormality, they weren't smokers, they weren't diabetics, et cetera. So a very low risk group. And what he was able to show is even in that context, tremendously strong relationship with cardiogenic calcium, a, a really important indicator, uh, intermediate indicator of atherosclerosis. And he showed that for all cardiogenic calcium and for the more serious uh, cardiogenic calcium distribution that we would diffuse distribution around, around uh, the coronavirus. He also showed in a 14 and a half year follow-up of those participants that they were more likely to have, uh, with higher pressures, they were more likely to have other risk factors like hyperlipidemia, et cetera. And we know that they, they, these risk factors track together. Most importantly, he showed that there was a very strong relationship with atherosclerotic clinical events on like heart attacks and strokes. And you can see down here uh, the risk for the lowest category of pressure to the highest category of pressure. And these are very striking um, risk relationships, over sixfold unadjusted, and even adjusted almost fivefold. So that's telling us that. This pattern of blood pressure relationship actually goes way down past what we normally think about. And it's really important in, in terms of the early pathogenesis of atherosclerotic plaque. So I think it's a very important publication. Now, can we get to these low pressures? Well, in isolated societies, we find these low pressures quite a bit. And uh, uh, the chair of our department of epidemiology, Jean Hal, he did a fantastic thesis, and that was why I first met him uh, in the uh, E people in South China, showing, showing this and showing the effect of regional um, uh, movement. Um, but I'm showing here a study from uh, Brazil, two tribes. Uh, the tri this tribe here, the Tarreas, they have very little 
relationship with the outside world. They're very isolated. They, they do not want any contact. This is another group that's pretty isolated, the Mandukas. The Mandukas are pretty isolated, but the Jesuits have helped them over the years. And the Jesuits introduced them to salt for uh, preserving their food and, and for taste. And you'll see in the pattern of blood pressure with age, it's very different. In the group that's completely isolated, flat pressures, just like we see in other isolated populations, maybe about 30 or more of them. And in the uh, Mandukas, a pattern that is much more similar to what we see in the U.S. and we see elsewhere around the world. So systolic's increasing over time up until late age, diastolic's increasing until about the fifth decade, and then flat and you're declining. So clearly, biologically, we can get these low pressures, but one of the challenges we have in our current environment is that we're exposed to things like sodium and so on that, that uh, makes that uncommon. Now, <clears throat> in the 2017 ACCHA guideline, we um, try to categorize, uh, and, and categorizing blood pressure is artificial biologically, but it's useful. So it identifies people you see at different levels, we should intervene in different ways. And uh, these are the blood pressure categories and the names we gave, the equivalent names for normal pressure, elevated pressure, and hypertension, either stage one or stage two. And <clears throat> this is a slightly different definition than what we had before. Previously, we had 140 over 90 as the designation of hypertension. But over the years, of course, this designation has moved down. So if you look at people in this blood pressure category or taking any hypertensive medication, it's a substantial percent of the US general population, almost half, which is unfortunate. You hate to say half of the people have a problem, but it's a reflection of the reality that over almost half the people are pretty high risk, high enough that we would recommend drugs as well as non-pharmacology intervention for all of the stage twos and for the stage ones that are high risk. Now, why do we do that? When you look at blood pressure at any given level of blood pressure, what you'll find is there's tremendous variability in the likelihood of a cardiovascular event over a period of time. And here I'm showing 10 years, and you'll see here, some people are quite low risk. They're not likely to have a major event over the next 10 years. On the other hand, there are people who are very likely, almost you know, 40% in this category at high risk are likely to have an event. And when we look at treatment trials uh, based on underlying uh, atherosclerotic risk at the start, the relative benefit of lowering blood pressure is pretty similar across these different categories of risk. But the absolute benefit, which is what's important to a patient, is very different. So as you get to the higher risk setting, you get much more benefit, not surprisingly. So we basically look at this and say, you know, there's not much value to aggressive treatment down here if the goal is to prevent an event. On the other hand, if you're up here at high risk, it makes great sense from a risk perspective and from what we know from treatment trials. So that really got us to um, uh, an algorithm then that you know, gave advice for normal blood pressure, elevated blood pressure, stage two and stage one. And, and we said for stage two, in addition to non-drug treatments, mostly lifestyle change, uh, drugs should always be used. And for stage one, it really depended on what their underlying risk was. If they had already had an event, or they, we did a calculation using the cool port equation, they were above about 10%, which is about the average risk we see in blood pressure trials. We recommended treatment with those non harm and drugs. That's about 30% of stage one, so it's the minority. And the treatments are, of course, uh, non-drug, and we have a lot of non-drug approaches, and they, they work well. They're well proven in clinical trials. Weight loss, healthy diet, uh, reducing dietary sodium, 
enhancing through diet, uh, diet through potassium, physical activity of all sorts, particularly aerobic as well, proven, and moderation of uh, abstinence from alcohol. Now with your silver here, the expected benefits, this is a little artificial because the, uh, the healthy diet here is a DASH diet, the dietary approach is to stop hypertension. It's very good, but here the, the issue is it's, a, it's a, a feeding trial. So you know the intervention is very well received because everyone is changing their diet. The other studies are more behavioral change, which is much harder. So. If you looked at DASH as a behavioral approach, it's pretty similar to the others combined. But overall, all of these are very important, well-proven. They're the fundamental things we should be doing because high blood pressure really occurs due to three things, uh, dietary factors, insufficient physical activity, and uh, alcohol intake. Those are the three things that really are responsible for high pressure. So that we would recommend for all, and then drug therapy, as I mentioned, for, for some individuals. Uh, and what drugs to pick? Well, if the, in some, there are many people, particularly at older age, who have a compelling indication for a particular drug for another reason, be it post-MI or um, diabetes, or they have uh, heavy proteinuria with kidney disease or a storm. There's no compelling indication. Um, our conclusion was that really lowering blood pressure is the most important, uh, the most important one to do. And if you looked at classes of any hypertensives versus diuretics, there was very strong evidence uh, compared to placebo with diuretics, calcium channel blockers, and ACE inhibitors, and ARBs were very effective in reducing cardiovascular events. Diuretics probably a little better than the other three, but overall we said, you know, use any one of these. We also said uh, for most people, starting with two drugs makes sense, and especially for those with higher levels of blood pressure and those at highest risk. African Americans for a given level of blood pressure have a higher risk, so they should be started on two drugs. And now we're learning from a lot of trials with uh, polyfill versus the standard step care that polyfill does better in achieving control and maintaining control. So the increasing body of evidence to suggest that combinations uh, are, are useful. The goal we set was less than 130 over 80, and there's abundant evidence to um, justify that goal generally. The largest and uh, most powerful um, meta-analysis or pooling of clinical trials, one done by uh, here at Tulane, uh, Josh Pundy is a faculty member in, in epidemiology is the lead on this. And it's a very nice uh, study. It's what's called a network meta-analysis where you can take uh, a lot of different studies, you can pool them and you can get randomized comparisons and it gives you a lot more statistical power, or if you will, precision to see the effect. So I'm just going to show the effect versus uh, a very low, uh, relatively low target, 120 over 124. And obviously, if you're comparing that to treatment with a target that's quite high, you get a huge benefit. But even down to pretty small differences, 124, 120, 124 versus 125, 129, you're still seeing significant benefit. And you see that not only for what I'm showing here are all cardiovascular events, but the individual components, stroke, heart attack, heart failure. It doesn't really matter whether you include or exclude key trials like SPRINT, you'll see the same thing. And there are many other meta-analysis that have shown this. And so Virtually all the guidelines around the world are suggesting going to lower pressures than we did in the past. Now, we even recommend that lower pressure uh, in those who are older. Uh, and this is an area that obviously is a cause for some degree of concern because we worry maybe we'll take the pressure too low, something bad would happen to an older person. But in fact, in at least the SPRINT trial, uh, older people, and we had quite a few of them over 
two and a half thousand. They did very well, and they did well for the composite of cardiovascular events for the primary outcome and for a very important outcome, all-cause mortality. And what really has made people a bit nervous in older ages uh, and in intensive treatment of blood pressure is that when they've done analysis, observational analysis, they've reported what's called a J-curve or a U-curve that at the lower levels of blood pressure, you get an uptake in risk. And so that has led to people saying, don't go too low. Well, we've looked at this in SPRINT and uh, in both the intensive treatment arm where we had a goal of less than 120 and the standard treatment arm where our goal was uh, less than 140 and we got very close to those two goals. We saw uh, a U-shaped curve, uh, both for the primary outcome and for all-cause mortality. So the J, the J or the U curve was there, but when you did the proper analysis, which is a randomized comparison, those treated more intensively always did better. And that was especially true as you got to lower pressures, was, this, is the, uh, this is the group that's at highest risk. So I'm not saying we should treat them without care, but I am saying that it seems that there's benefit. We also looked at that older age group by frailty. And you, you might be most worried about people who are frail. Perhaps the pressures will go down, they'll get a cyclical episode, they'll fall over, et cetera. We don't really see that much in the, in the trials at least. And again, in SPRINT, the frail groups seem to do just about the same pattern as those who are uh, very fit and those who are moderately fit. And one thing one can use in a clinical setting is gait speed. It's a very potent predictor of risk. So people who come in briskly are into the clinic, uh, they're, they're gonna be much, much healthier than people who shuffle in and, and you know they're not able to walk very well. But again, even in that low gait speed group, there is tremendous benefit from more intensive blood pressure treatment. So all the indications are that we should try to treat and try to treat within reason, uh, if tolerated as low as one can get. The other thing we saw in SPRINT, uh, which relates to older people, is cognitive impairment and dementia. And these are, of course, part of, a, of, of an arc of natural history. And we looked at uh, cognitive impairment, we call it mild, and probably we shouldn't have used that term. It is what it is, it's cognitive impairment. And we were able to see a difference between the intensive treatment group and the standard group quite early on after about a year, and it was there throughout the trial and after the trial. It was quite uh, substantial and it was uh, very statistically significant. We didn't see many dementia events, uh, and most of those occurred at a later stage. And that's a challenge with the uh, way trials have been designed. And in fact, in SPRINT, we had hoped to continue um, a randomized comparison, a slightly different one, uh, uh, intensive care versus usual care, allowing um, the primary care physicians to change as, as needs be that are the funding agency, in this case the NIH, decided to stop the trial. So we did post-trial follow-up, and when you do a randomized uh, analysis of that, uh, you don't have enough event events to really see a significant difference, but pattern is there. And if you combine as a composite outcome, um, cognitive impairment of dementia, it's a significant difference. We also did MRI sub-studies. Uh, sub it's not the entire trial, so you have to be careful in interpreting it, but we saw less white matter, uh, dense white matter uh, material in the intensively treated group compared to the standard group. And this is uh, probably a good indicator of um, intermediate marker of uh, dementia. And that's been seen in another trial, a smaller one, the Infinity trial, where they did ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. So, you know, not, not completely convincing, but uh, strongly suggestive.
We also recommend to use uh, lower, more intensive treatment than diabetics. We didn't have diabetics in SPRINT, but we did have pre-diabetics, and we saw the same benefit in pre-diabetics of uh, normal glycemics. The big concern for most people is ACCORD, which was an intensive treatment trial, which didn't show benefit in the diabetics. And we now know that Part of the problem here was almost certainly the design of this trial. Unlike SPRINT, which was a sort of straightforward two-arm trial, this was what's called a factorial. There were two treatments, blood pressure control, glycemic control. Just like many things in life, it's wonderful if everything goes well, but you make a big assumption. And the assumption is there's no interaction between this intervention and that intervention. If you get that interaction, it's very hard to do the overall analysis. And unfortunately in SPRINT, that occurred. And what I'm showing here is the pattern for benefit for intensive blood pressure lowering in SPRINT compared to what was seen in uh, Accord. And if you split out Accord into the two groups, the group that did not get intensive glycemic control, that group is shown up here, standard glycemia, they seem to get a benefit from blood pressure reduction that was very similar to SPRINT. And it was the group that got the intensive glycemic uh, control that seemed to do better. As you may know, intensive glycemic control was stopped in Accord because it was associated with a, a rather significant increase in all-cause mortality. So nobody would recommend the type of intensive glycemic control that uh, was used in, in uh, Accord anymore. Another thing that's very interesting, if you take the group in Accord that were in this, uh, in the, these cells here of intensive glycemic control, while it was still going on, you, you'll see exactly what I said. No benefit for intensive treatment, in fact, maybe a little worse. Once that intensive glycemic intervention was stopped, the pattern changed dramatically and it became just like sprint uh, with the intensive group doing much better. So again, not perfect evidence, but strong evidence that uh, getting to lower pressures in this high risk group, and you can't think of a much higher risk group than a diabetic with high blood pressure who's an adult <clears throat> is beneficial. Now, Flipping over to the relationship between coronavirus and blood pressure, I don't have to tell you about coronavirus. You may know more about it than me, but it, you know, it starts in animals typically, uh, all of these coronaviruses, and then later on you see human-to-human -human transmission. The current one, the coronavirus 19, is, of course, is called by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, that virus has a spherical shape with these little uh, protein spikes, or so-called S spikes. And uh, that protrudes, and uh, it's very important in terms of the relationship to uh, the, the renin angiotensin system. That spike fuses to human cells, and that's what allows the virus to gain entry. COVID-19 obviously started in Wuhan in December. I was in Wuhan for about a week in December. I didn't know there was any COVID-19 around. And fortunately, I don't seem to have been exposed to it. But obviously, it moved uh, from China, where it was largely confined to Wuhan and Hubei uh, province. Uh, and it moved elsewhere. And now it's in just about every country. Uh, I think Afghanistan is about the only country that's not reporting it. The five most affected countries in terms of reported virus uh, are the big population countries, US, Brazil, India, Russia, South Africa. But, uh, you know, you look at the map and it's everywhere. And uh, this is just looking globally uh, within the US and Louisiana. And then the number of cases, of course, is hard to interpret because it has a lot to do with how much testing is being conducted. And that varies a lot from country to country. I think looking at deaths is probably a slightly better indicator. And you see the totals globally in the US about typing on the report of all deaths uh, in, in occurring in the US. So it's a huge problem everywhere, especially in the US. If you look at the renin angiotensin system, uh, 
as you may know, the cascade is a star with angiotensinogen that is converted to angiotensin 1, which is a decapeptide. Uh, the ACE then knocks off two peptides to form an octopeptide, angiotensin 2, which is the active potent part of the system that attaches to the ACE receptor, and that's then what causes a variety of activities for, in blood pressure. We think about it really as being a, a vasoconstrictor. Um, the relationship here is that the ACE receptors are found not only in the vascular system, just where those of us in cardiovascular disease think about it, but it's found in all over the body, uh, certainly in the alveolar cells, in the lungs, the epithelial cells of the small intestine, lymphocytes, you name it, there are receptors. And the way SARS-CoV-2 gets in, of course, is indeed that it comes down and that S spike attaches to the ACE2 receptor and that's how it enters the cell. And so that wide distribution it really uh, is a good explanation for why you see a variety of uh, manifestations of, uh, of COVID-19 infection, not just the severe lung involvement, but also the GI involvement, case loss, uh, lymphopenia. And we know uh, very well from animal and human studies that when you block the receptor, whether it be through ACE or an ARB, you tend to get more receptors generated. So there is what's called upregulation of the receptors. A lot more receptors occur. So it's certainly natural to start thinking then, well, maybe if we've got upregulation of receptors, that's a bad thing. And as the early studies came in from uh, China, the first thing that was noted is that people who got hospitalized and had adverse outcomes tended to be older than those who didn't have adverse outcomes didn't get hospitalized. So within the U.S., what we saw is, yes, uh, most people who were hospitalized were older. Um, a lot of the uh, comorbidities, hypertension being by far the most common one everywhere, Here's a report from CDC in the US. Hypertension, obesity, CKD, diabetes, mellitus, CBD. And looking again in uh, China at the primary endpoints, uh, what you tend to find is much more common in the individuals uh, in hypertension compared to those with others. So at an early stage, there started to be concern about this. Um, this is what we're seeing in Louisiana in uh, those who have um, been hospitalized with, um, with uh, COVID-19. Very high prevalence of hypertension. I mean, you see a lot of other risk factors and, and uh, non-cardiovascular risk factors, but very high prevalence of hypertension. And you're looking at these and, and immediately people are thinking, well, these are the sort of people who are probably likely to be treated with uh, ACE inhibitors and with ARBs. And when we look at the general population of the United States and say, how many people with blood pressure, and I'm just focusing on blood pressure now, are treated with ACE and ARBs, it's over half of all hypertensives in the U.S not even touching on diabetes or some of the other indications. Now, when we look at reports that came in from Italy, this is ACE and ARDS in patients with COVID-19. It's a pretty much what I showed you in the previous slide, over half of them on ACEs or ARDS. So it's not surprising that there started to be a lot of speculation about the relationship. And this started really in February. It emerged in those who were on the front line, uh, emergency medicine blogs. I saw a lot of them was alerted to those and other frontline blogs. And it quickly uh, spread from there to uh, lay blog sites, to popular press, radio, TV, talk shows. And then we started to see a number of manuscripts published. And I'll just mention a few manuscripts. This is from a colleague of ours at LSU in environmental health science. I won't go through the entire thing, but he uh, certainly speculates more likely to be taking, these are people with uh, 
COVID-19, more likely to be taking ACEs are the greater risk to uh, coronavirus, et cetera. And he just bluntly says ACE and R appears to be a risk factor for more severe disease outcomes. He wasn't the only one. This is in Lancet Respired for Medicine. We therefore hypothesized that diabetes and hypertension treatment with A2 uh, stimulating drugs uh, increases the risk of developing severe and fatal COVID-19. And in uh, EMJ itself, the few most likely to be effective might choose to adopt proportionally uh, principles, referring long-term cardiovascular benefit to reducing the theoretical short-term risk from continued treatment for our factors. So there were calls to move people who were on these agents off of them to other agents. And uh, starting around late February, March, uh, I and I'm sure many others started to get lots of uh, contacts, mostly by email, but also colleagues, um, calls from a lot of colleagues in Italy and Spain and some colleagues in China. Uh, and they wanted to ask you about their patients, but usually you knew that it was a family member of the spouse or it was a, a parent or some other family member. And we had a lot of discussion in uh, societies. I'm the president elect of the World Hypertension League. This is a, a hypertension league that has uh, relationships to, with societies in about 70 countries around the world. And we put out a fairly detailed statement in early March uh, recommending continuation of uh, any hypertensive treatment with whatever drugs were being used. Many other professional societies, including ACC, AHA, uh, ESC, ESH, they also published uh, statements. And everyone who had looked at the data were not convinced and recommended continuing current treatments, what we all call for additional research. And indeed, since then, there have been numerous studies that have been looking at this relationship. So these studies are a mix. So the early ones were, you know, descriptive cross-sectional studies. Of course, you can do an analytic uh, analysis in a, in a cross-sectional study, but it's not very helpful because you don't have any temporal sequence. Uh, they were followed later on by case control studies uh, where you know you, you start with cases who have COVID-19 or some other manifestation of COVID-19, the severe outcomes, etc., and controls those who don't have it. And then you try to go back in time to look at the exposure. In this case, um, RAS inhibitors, where they're getting ACEs and ARBs. And there have been three of those reported, one very good case control study, a large population-based case control study from Lombardy, uh, which was the epicenter of the outbreak in, in uh, Italy by Giuseppe, Nancy, and colleagues. Uh, but most people have, have done prospective designs where we start with the exposure, uh, taking ACEs or ARBs or not taking them, and then we follow them over time to look at the outcome. And uh, all of these are based on what I would call non-concurrent uh, cohorts. That is, you're using an existing database to perform the analysis. So we're usually looking at the medical record and we're saying, when this person was admitted to a hospital, were they on ACEs or ARBs or were they not? And what was the outcome? Did they have a more or less severe outcome? That's one way to try to look at it. Now, this is often called a retrospective core study. I, I hate this term because it's actually a prospective analysis, you know, and I think retrospective is misleading, but it is uh, not concurrent. There have been a lot of these types of studies, uh, at least 24, and there were a few more that were withdrawn. Um, and unfortunately, in the crisis, stuff got published even in New England Journal that shouldn't have been published. There are some clinical trials ongoing, or at least four that I'm aware of. Uh, none of them are powered to assess clinical events, so we're looking at blood pressure outcomes. So this is a case control study from Lombardy, and I won't go into huge detail, but it's showing here the odds ratio for COVID-19 infection in the context of uh, mass inhibitors. Um, no use. Uh, used as monotherapy, or as it would be more commonly used in a combination with other antitensives. 
And whether you're looking unadjusted or perhaps more importantly, uh, preferably looking at adjusted for other factors that may be potentially confounded, there's no suggestion uh, that RAS inhibitor treatment is related to higher infection rates from COVID-19. And likewise, over here, looking at um, uh, outcomes with these uh, agents, uh, any, any hypertensive agent, ACE inhibitor here are calcium channel blockers, diuretics, even beta blockers, mild to moderate disease, uh, critical or fatal disease. You see really no difference across the path. We've seen the same sort of thing in um, in uh, cohort studies, and uh, this is the meta meta analysis that my colleagues and I uh, did. It's not yet published, so it's not to be reproduced. But here are the cohort studies. We will uh, identify 24 cohorts, and you'll see here's the line of identity. Overall, there's really no suggestion of worsening of disease or improvement in the outcome. And here are the three case controls um, pooled and same sort of thing. So the data now, of which we have quite a, a lot, is fairly compelling that um, there's no striking relationship and uh, the presence of COVID, concerns about COVID-19 should not influence the decisions around continuing ACEs or ARDs or starting um, new, newly with ACEs or ARDs. What about the implications of COVID-19? Well, we know in the short term, it's very disruptive. It's very disruptive for healthcare services. Uh, interestingly, um, we have a rather large uh, research study being done in, in um, federally qualified health clinics in Louisiana and Mississippi. Uh, there are primary care clinics in, in uh, settings where you have Dis disenfranchised uh, individuals living. It's very interesting there. Uh, the providers have found virtual visits to be very good. And what they say is, we always were moving in this direction, but COVID-19 just sped us up and we, we love it. And the patients also like it. Uh, we've done a survey of our participants. Catherine Mills is the lead author in the Department of Immunology in, in that particular trial. And again, patients say they really like um, virtual visits. For the providers, the no-show rates are very low in the order of about 3%, whereas in these uh, FHQCs, they were used to seeing about 30% no-show rates of it's, it's very attractive and it's very time efficient for both providers and patients. Generally speaking, if a patient has a time for a virtual visit, it's going to recur at that time. For many of the patients, what they say is they don't have to worry about transport. Uh, many of the poorer patients have to take buses from A to B and B to C, and they have to sit in the waiting room. So it, it saves them on time and cost. So interesting to me, the primary care providers and their patients, at least in the context in which I'm operating, seem to be very happy with the virtual visits. Now, obviously the virtual visits don't work so well, especially here. My daughter, who is a interventional cardiologist, she does virtual visits, but they're not very helpful for anyone who really needs her attention. COVID-19 in the short term is, of course, been also very disruptive for the conduct of uh, research, certainly in my area in cardiovascular disease. It, it, it's very challenging with tremendous variability in what's possible across different countries. And many of our studies, we've got many countries involved and across those countries and even within the larger countries uh, like the US and Brazil and China, there's tremendous variability in what's allowed and what's not a lot and it changes a lot. So in the existing studies, um, recruitment disease are halted as it is here or it's limited in, uh, in other countries. The provision of intervention and follow-up has been very challenging and we've had to put much greater emphasis on measures that can be conducted outside the clinic setting. Um, we've been lucky in that trial I mentioned in Louisiana and Mississippi to have pre-existing home blood pressure monitoring. 
And in many of the trials I'm involved in, we are implementing home blood pressure monitoring. It's also very disruptive for planning for new studies. I'm chairing a steering committee for three large trials, two of which are supposed to go into the field in early 2021. We just don't know whether that's going to be able to happen or not. This is a, a recruitment pattern from two trials, uh, two big event-based trials that we're conducting in Brazil, with my colleagues there. These are looking at sprint-like interventions to look at cardiovascular disease and, um, uh, and dementia and cognitive impairment. One is being done in diabetics and the other is being done in stroke survivors. And you can see the pattern for recruitment by month here. It was moving up very nicely in the diabetes trial. COVID-19 hit and suddenly it pulls off the cliff. And in Brazil, they're slowly opening up again. They're, they're um, getting back, but it's nothing like where we were or where we need to be. Same as happening in the stroke trial. It's a challenge, and we're seeing similar challenge in other countries. That's the short-term problems. Now, what about long-term problems? Well, I think we've learned from crises around the world that yes, there are long-term problems and we've learned lessons from Katrina. And here is an example of what happened in terms of cardiovascular disease hospitalization rates in, uh, in the Katrina uh, era. So this is in Orleans Parish, obviously the parish most affected by uh, Katrina. This is pre-Katrina and here's post-Katrina. And you can see it's a huge difference. There's a big uptick in cardiovascular disease admissions, including acute myocardial infarction. On the other hand, when you go to East Baton Rouge, uh, a parish that really wasn't affected directly by uh, Katrina, you don't really see any uh, effect. So we know that we see this uh, sort of thing happening, not only post Katrina, but we see it after other disasters. This is the Japanese earthquake and the tsunami that uh, affected the uh, east coast, upper northeast coast of uh, Japan. There is uh, Fukushima nuclear reactor. And there is a registry, um, <coughs> A registry, a cardiovascular registry that is uh, being conducted in uh, uh, an area called Hiawate. And they've subdivided that into the upper area, which was likely affected by the uh, tsunami and earthquake, and the lower part, which is more directly affected. And what you see for fatal myocardial infarction, much, much greater incidence uh, over time, and you'll see this continuing over several years in the highly affected part of uh, Iwate compared to the lowly affected. And you can show that here in a relationship. Um, this is the standard uh, incidence ratio uh, by the extent of damage, and that's measured by something called TFA. And we've got TFA down here, and the uh, um, standard incident ratio up here, and the greater the damage, the more you tend to get the uptick. So it's a dose res strong dose response relationship. So those are two examples, but we see the same sort of thing around many disasters, natural or unnatural. And there's a very nice study that was done uh, here at uh, Tulane in uh, Tulane University uh, um, Hospital. Uh, mostly uh, by the group in uh, Cardiovascular Institute and uh, um, biostatistics. And again, this is looking at acute myocardial infarction incidence pre and post Katrina. Two years pre Katrina, uh, they published six years after Katrina. More recently, they published 10 years after Katrina. And what you'll see is there's a continuing effect. And, I, and, and this is out to 10 years, and that's almost a fourfold increase. So it's not just a short term impact, it's a longer term impact. And there's also a difference in the pattern of acute myocardial infarction, much more in the way of nighttime events and weekend events. And the explanation for that is that these sorts of disasters interrupt the provision of healthcare. And this is looking at um, 
various characteristics six years after Katrina and that group, 10 years after Katrina. Uh, and what you're seeing is a tremendous amount of risk factor exposure, a much, much greater uh, risk factors uh, than there were pre-Katrina and uh, also, things like psychiatric illness and drug abuse, so your what would lead to non-adherence, lack of medical insurance, unemployment, all those sorts of things that drive disease. So not terribly surprising that we're seeing these outcomes and we're seeing them over a long period of time. So in summary, high blood pressure is probably the most important risk factor for atherosclerosis and cardiovascular events. Contemporary guidelines recommend more intensive treatment than we recommended in previous guidelines. And that's true for every guideline with the exception that ours, the Europeans, the Canadians, the Australians, the only one that is an odd man out is AFP and ACP, where they say for older people, getting to 150 uh, systolic is enough. Nobody else agrees with that. And we're all thinking about older people now as more functional. If, if they're functioning well, try to get them pressure down. Coronavirus enters human cells through the uh, ACE receptor. Um, RAS inhibitors, when they're used, tend to lead to more ACE receptors of regulation. It's not unreasonable to speculate that RAS inhibitors might increase the risk for COVID-19 from infection and the severity of the outcome, but in fact, case control studies and cohort studies now pretty convincingly suggest that that's not really true. But over and above that, there is a very important effect of these sorts of disasters on short-term uh, provision of healthcare and long-term implications for healthcare, adverse healthcare that we need to be very aware of and we need to try to handle. So again, I'm gonna stop at that point and thank you very, very much for inviting me to uh, participate today. Well, <clears throat> thank you very much for this uh, uh, very interesting uh, presentation. I want to remind uh, uh, participants online that they can uh, type their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'd like to lead uh, with a uh, question, maybe even a second question, but first, uh, uh, your cohort and meta-analyses, meta do they show uh, that hypertension is an independent risk factor? Are they really overrepresented, uh, or is it just a uh, associated comorbidity as uh, the older individuals are uh, affected by the uh, uh, infection? No question that uh, no question that COVID nineteen and the consequence of COVID nineteen are more is more both are more common in the context of high blood pressure. Uh, when you look at the specific effect of the uh, ACE inhibitors and the ARBs, we will then adjust for or try to neutralize the effect of high blood pressure. So. Um, these, what I showed you was um, analysis that are adjusted for things that are known to be directly related to COVID-19 uh, uh, outcomes for the, for the cohort studies. Okay, uh, Paul, I, I have a second question. There's one online also. The second one is actually, uh, there were some speculation. I, I think you kind of debunked those, but uh, that actually, uh, uh, ARB blockade treatment upregulates ACE2, and uh, as the virus binds to the ACE2, uh, it can actually facilitate viral shedding and clearance, and it yes. may uh, confer a beneficial <clears throat> effect. Uh, I mean, obviously, yeah. your broad analyses uh, not support that, but you have any comments on mm -hmm. that? Yes, uh, both of those speculations were out there. I didn't mention that one. I mean, the common speculation is that uh, Things would be worse, but you're right. Uh, there was speculation that it might be improved to this one cohort study that has reported an improvement, but it's an outlier. Uh, and I think when you look at the total picture, I think the evidence suggests that it neither improves nor worsens the situation, both with respect to infection 
and the outcomes once infected. Okay, uh, there is a comment and a question uh, from Dr. Crane. Great review, thanks Paul. More recent data suggests that chlorothaladone is really no better than HCTZ. Any comments on that? Thank you again. Um, well, I think the preponderance of evidence is that we, we probably do get somewhat better results with um, long-acting agents. There have been a number of observational studies that are very flawed, and I've sent letters in for a number of them that have tried to compare um, short-acting diuretics, shorter-acting diuretics like uh, hydrochlorothiazide and uh, chlorothaladone, <coughs> but with propensity scores, but they're, they're not done very well. They sort of compare apples and oranges. Uh, you know, for most of our recent trials, we've used longer acting agents, and it stands to reason that a longer acting agent is a safer one because the half-life of something like um, hydrochlorothiazide is relatively short, and you may not get good blood pressure control overnight, whereas the half-life of something like endapamide or chlorothaladone is, is quite long. I think the big challenge is that for combinations, most pharmaceutical companies, particularly in this country, have chosen to combine other classes with, um, chlorth with um, hydrochlorothiazide or with chlorothalone. And that was one of the reasons when we did the 2017 ACCHA, we said combinations are good, but the challenge is we don't have perfect combinations in this country. And we have a number of big trials going on now looking at um, combinations with longer acting agents. And they started with chlorothaladone, but because chlorothaladone is not marketed in many countries, they're tending now to be using indapamide more than chlorothaladone. More than one would expect a pretty similar benefit with uh, indapamide. Thank you. One last question from uh, Dr. Google. One of the difficulties in clinical practice is getting an accurate measure of patient's blood pressure. What has limited the utilization of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring in clinical practice? Well, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly something that we're doing more of. I think in the US, ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is not very available. You 